St. Patrick's Day, New York. 40 million Americans claim Irish descent. This is their chance to celebrate their achievement as one of the largest and richest communities in the United States. They are so successful, in fact, that many other New Yorkers are also happy to be Irish for the day. It's hard to believe that some of these people are the descendants of Irish immigrants who first came here 150 years ago in misery and despair. This is the story of how the people of a green and fertile country came to starve and why the repeated failure of the potato crop led to the deaths of a million people and the emigration of perhaps a million more. The dead uncoffined, naked, funerals consisting only of the cart driver and someone to help in putting the bodies into the grave. As for the little children, they seem to me to be all stunted in their growth and bearing as close a resemblance as possible to unfledged birds. The same morning, the police opened a house on the adjoining land, which was observed shut for many days, and two frozen corpses were found, lying upon the mud floor, half devoured by rats. Dublin is known today as the capital city of Ireland. But in the first half of the 19th century, Ireland was essentially a British colony, and Dublin was one of the jewels in Britain's imperial crown. Ireland had been left behind by the Industrial Revolution, except for parts of the Northeast. Whatever wealth she had didn't come from commerce and industry, but from agriculture. And most of that wealth was controlled by the Anglo-Irish, descendants of early English settlers who had taken over the country 200 years before. Historian Ian Gibson is about to start a journey that will touch four countries and cross an ocean in search of the truth about the Great Irish Famine. In the times leading up to the famine, about three quarters of the Irish population was Roman Catholic. Despite their numbers, they lived in a Protestant state and were not allowed to have their own churches. At one time, their priests were so persecuted they had to say mass in secret. Again, he gave you thanks and praise. Gave the cup to his disciples and said, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. This is the cup of my blood, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant. It will be shed for you and for all, so that sins may be forgiven. Do this in memory of me. Since the early 18th century, a series of laws had severely penalized Irish Catholics. They were forbidden to hold government office, they couldn't go to school, and they weren't even allowed to buy or sell land unless they turned Protestant. In practice, few of these laws were rigorously enforced and they were all repealed by 1829. But their very existence was an insult to Catholics who were made to feel like second-class citizens in their own land. The established Church of Ireland was Protestant, which meant it served the spiritual needs of only about one-seventh of the population. Irish Catholics often hated the Church of Ireland because while they never entered its doors, they had to pay tithes to support it. And it was the religion of the ruling class. At the time of the famine, 
Over 80% of the land and almost all the great houses, like this one at Strokestown Park, were owned by Anglo-Irish gentry. Most of these landlords were descendants of English adventurers who had been granted lands by the kings of England in the 16th and 17th centuries. They looked down on the native Irish people and went to great lengths to avoid them. Here in the kitchen, the lady of the house avoided contact with her lowly Irish servants by dropping the daily menu from the gallery above. In the stable yard, a tunnel passes beneath the garden. The servants had to use it to cross from one end of the building to the other, so the ladies and gentlemen of the house wouldn't have to see them. Similarly, the landlord had little contact with the poor people on his estate, even though he presided over a ramshackle pyramid of tenancies and sub-tenancies. Often the estate was hopelessly in debt, so the land was rented to wealthy tenants on long leases. Tenants would then divide and sublet the land to less wealthy tenants, and so on and so on down the economic scale. In the remote Irish-speaking districts of the South and West, the poorest tenants would often subdivide their land into tiny plots, which they parceled out to family members. So you get uh, a, a dualistic uh, system where the better off farmers tend not to subdivide and so the, uh, the inequality in the uh, distribution of land over time is becoming greater. Um, farms that are of 50 or 100 acres in say the year 1800 are still more or less like that in 1845 but farms of 10 acres, many of them would have been divided into three of three acres or two of five acres or whatever. Another difference uh, is that on the bigger farms, uh, people tend to marry later. And where subdivision is occurring, uh, you get uh, early marriage and more frequent marriage. What you have is a society where there was, in some areas, quite a lot of vacant land available, which was only under very loose control. And basically, access to land was relatively easy, much easier for a young person without capital than in Britain or in a lot of other parts of Northern Europe at the time. And the, the importance of that is that, first of all, people could marry and set, set up home at a relatively early age. Secondly, the size of holdings could become quite small. The result is that by the 1840s you have a lot of people in Ireland living on very, very small holdings of land. So you have a very strange picture in Ireland where there's almost an inverse relationship between land fertility and population density. In other words, a lot of the smallest plots of land are on the worst quality soil. In Western Ireland, farmers had to contend with poor, stony ground and with very heavy rainfall, which reduced the fertility of the soil. The climate was better suited for grazing cattle than for growing corn. The only crop they could count on was potatoes. Splendiferous spud, one of nature's greatest inventions, full of nutrition. It's got carbohydrate, it's got protein, it's got lots of vitamins. It's a bit weak on vitamin A, so we put in some buttermilk. 
or if there's some greens handy, that will also do the job. A man can live on potatoes perfectly easily. In fact, the potato transformed life in the remote countryside, like here on the coast of Mayo. For almost 5,000 years, the Irish had lived mostly off their cattle. And then, around the early 18th century, they discovered that growing potatoes helped them to raise far larger families on far smaller plots of land. The people are gone, but the land is still ribbed with lazy beds, the ridges where they once grew their potatoes. Those ridges would indicate tremendous pressure on the land because I think one has to be under great pressure to be up here at all, tilling this land. There's so much rock and there's so much stone. It certainly isn't the best land for cultivation, and yet there is intensive cultivation here. Um, all these plots of, of ridges, and the height of those ridges, I think some of them are never dug out. There is an indication that crops were planted here and never gave any return. But the interesting thing is that in grassland and in the pastoral tradition, that you've had 200 generations of that, and then relatively recent in looking at the whole perspective of Irish agriculture, you had this wonder food which came in from America, the potato. It allowed for a tremendous crops to be taken off tiny plots of uh, tiny plots of ridges. It gave this tremendous crop. It meant that you had a massive explosion of population, but then disaster hit. And possibly what we're looking at is that moment of disaster when this wonder crop showed that there was a negative side to it as well. After what was a relatively short episode, the period of the potato. Thanks to the success of the new crop, by the 1840s, eight million people lived in Ireland, almost half of them existing only on potatoes. At this village, Sleeve Moor, on Ackle Island, the people were rich enough to keep a few cattle as well. Most of the well-to-do families would have owned about six cows. Some would have had a pony, others would have had a couple of donkeys. The climate in Ireland actually um, is, uh, particularly in the west of Ireland, is very mild. So they would have been kept in the fields around in what is called the outfield. But in winter, weather conditions were very bad. Some of them would have been brought into the houses. In a lot of the houses, actually, you had the opposing doorway, which is a very ancient feature indeed. It goes back to early medieval times. And it is, uh, we surmise that this is to facilitate the cattle being brought in the front door here, uh, milked, and then brought out the back or west door, so that the cattle wouldn't have to be turned around in the house. Seaweed was very important as fertilizer for the potato crop. Many poor people lived as close to the sea as possible. Those who didn't would carry the seaweed on the backs of donkeys or on their own backs as much as 15 miles inland. Here in County Sligo, this is what the spring planting might have looked like in the middle of the 19th century. First, the men would spread a mixture of seaweed and manure, or sometimes seaweed alone, along the line of each ridge with a spade, or this tool called a loy. They cut underneath the turf and turned over the seaweed to make a kind of fertilizer sandwich between two layers of turf. They then planted seed potatoes using a tool which, in Sligo, they called a spud. Wheat only grew well in the east of Ireland, but some western farmers managed to raise a small crop of oats or barley to help pay the rent, while the family lived almost entirely on potatoes. <laughs> 
quarter of the population, over two million people, had no land at all. And they would trade their labor for a small potato patch on someone else's land. They also had access to ancient bogs where they could cut the peat or the turf that provided them with building material for their homes and fuel for the fire which kept them warm throughout the winter. And so, with the potatoes and the turf, they managed to raise large families and keep them in good health. But it was always a hand-to-mouth existence. There was one problem with the potato. Potatoes can only be stored for six to nine months. Between May, when the last harvest was exhausted, and October, when the new potatoes came in, the Irish starved a little every summer. In the summer of 1845, that was a minor inconvenience. Heavy August rains promised an abundant potato crop. This rural life was lampooned by the English as absurd. The Irish were as foreign to the British as South Sea Islanders. They were thought of as incapable of living a civilized existence. English visitors were often horrified by the extent of Irish poverty. A bed or a blanket is a rare luxury, and their pig and their manure heap constitute their only property. In less than 50 years, the population of Ireland had almost doubled. In a country so dependent upon the land for sustenance, this produced a crisis for the poor. 130 workhouses were built throughout Ireland. Poor people who sought refuge in them were known as paupers. If they were accepted, they had to prove they were destitute. I owned no land, no buildings, etc. They had to come in as a family unit. Mothers, children, they couldn't just come in as an individual. Once they actually got into the workhouse, they were then segregated very strictly according to gender. So men and women were separated. And then according to age, children under two were kept in a separate ward. Children aged two to 15 were separated from their parents. So there was a process of separation within the workhouse. And there was a strong disciplinary element as well. Poor people hated workhouses and that was the way the British officials wanted it. Relief should be made so unattractive as to furnish no motive to ask for it, except in the absence of every other means of subsistence. Rules were very strict and infringements were severely punished, sometimes by flogging, sometimes by solitary confinement. There was little need for the workhouse as long as the potato harvest was good. Historically, most crop failures had been limited to a few small areas and never lasted more than a season. In September of 1845, farmers in many districts found signs of a new disease on the leaves of some potato plants. No one knew it at the time, but it was potato blight, a fungus infection accidentally imported from America. There was, as yet, no cause for alarm, because when the crop was lifted that autumn, most of the tubers looked sound. It was an abundant harvest. But when the potatoes were placed in storage, they quickly began to rot. Very soon, people in many parts of Ireland were facing a winter without food. The government set up a scientific commission to try to find a cure for the disease. But scientific knowledge wasn't far enough advanced, and it would be years before a way was found to prevent potato blight. The immediate need was for an emergency food supply to replace the potato. The answer was another import from America. It was a grain known as maize, or Indian corn. In the fall of 1845, Sir Robert Peel, the British Prime Minister, imported Indian corn into Ireland on a vast scale. Surprisingly, little of the corn was made available for hungry people. The idea was never to provide a handout. Most of it was kept in government warehouses as an economic control over local grain merchants who would be forced to keep their own prices low in order to avoid being undercut by the sale of the government corn. The local grain merchants complained bitterly about government interference in their markets. <laughs> 
The problem was, poor people had no money to buy food at any price. So the government instituted public works, mostly road building programs in the most destitute areas. The projects were widely criticized as useless, and in fact, employment didn't always go to those who needed it most. But when a man got work, he could earn just about enough to buy meal and feed his family. In the winter of 1845-46, many people went hungry, but few actually starved. They were holding on desperately, believing that the next potato crop would make it possible for them to survive the following winter. In London, Prime Minister Peel was in political trouble over his control of the grain market with the imported American maize. At the time, farmers in England and in Ireland were virtually guaranteed a high price for their grain because of high tariffs on wheat imported from America. Peel tried to reduce those tariffs in order to bring down the price of food. He was bitterly opposed by English and Irish farmers who were already angered by his interference in their markets. In June of 1846, Peel and his Tory party fell from power and were replaced by the Liberal Party, known as the Whigs. The new Prime Minister, Lord John Russell, had little interest in Irish affairs and passed responsibility for famine relief to Sir Charles Wood, Chancellor of the Exchequer. But it was a British civil servant who would soon have the power of life and death over famine victims. Charles Trevelyan, Assistant Secretary of the Treasury. He didn't believe in government aid and his views were widely shared by Whig politicians. I do not think the way to raise the condition of the people is to give relief from any public fund. It is clear that the Irish pauper does not like work. I object to the principle of taxing the people in this country to relieve the distress of Ireland. In Ireland, hungry people spent the summer watching their potato patches looking for signs that the harvest would be healthy and abundant. In late July, in the space of a few days, their worst fears were realized. On the 27th of last month, I passed from Cork to Dublin, and this doomed plant bloomed in all the luxuriance of an abundant harvest. Returning on the third instant, I beheld with sorrow one wide waste of putrefying vegetation. potatoes seemed to resist the disease, and everywhere people scrambled in the soil, desperate to rescue them. Last year of suffering, most had exhausted what few resources they had. Now nothing was left, and with dreadful rapidity, they began to starve. The new Whig government was determined not to undercut the free market in corn and refused to bring fresh supplies to the government stores. Food prices soared 
and people went unfed. These pictures of poor women and children searching for food were drawn at the time by an artist from the illustrated London News. They passed through three stages. At first they faced starvation manfully, too proud to accept grudged help. Then they were mad with despair. Then they were full of hopeless resignation. The hunger is on us, tis the will of God. The will of God be done. They went on the shore and every rock and every every place you'd go was turned over with uh, looking for limpids and winkles. They had at everything. And then they started eating the seaweed, chopping it up and boiling it. And they died with dysentery and black fever and stalatine fever and yellow fever. They were dying every day later. Eating raw shellfish and seaweed caused dysentery. The people may have known that raw shellfish could be dangerous, but they were too desperate to care. They no longer had the strength to cut turf to cook their food. The weather that winter was the worst on record. It was described as one continuous storm. It takes great strength and agility to launch these west coast fishing boats through the breakers. Weakened by hunger, many fishermen drowned that winter. The others pawned their nets and used the money to buy food. In huge numbers, starving people turned to the public works, often laboring on useless projects, building roads to nowhere. The system as it operated in some places, tended to benefit uh, the strong and those who could work at the expense of those who couldn't. Um, and uh, in that sense, it was an inefficient uh, way of uh, providing relief. Again, it involved people working out in the open uh, in bad, bad clothes, in bad weather and so on. And that is not an ideal way of dealing with uh, people who are on the brink of dying. There was no other form of relief available that winter, so the Board of Public Works began to hire women, children, even old people. It gave them a wage, but at the same time, it didn't ensure that they had access to food. And the wage, in fact, was a starvation wage. It wasn't enough to buy food. In 1846, food prices soared within Ireland. But what the government had done was promise the corn merchants that it wouldn't import corn into the east of Ireland in 1846. And I think that is perhaps the government's greatest mistake. Grain exports from Ireland to England were less than half what they had been the previous year. But many people were angered to see any grain at all leaving the country at a time of such desperate need. Again, the government refused to intervene. There had been crop failures throughout Europe, but other governments, Belgium, Russia, Alexandria, were importing food. They were um, closing their ports to export, and they were actually providing bounties for food imported into their countries. The British government refused to do that, and it very much left Ireland to free market forces. <laughs> In many places, public markets offered food in plain sight of the people. But even the cheapest food available had tripled in price since the previous year, and the poor laboring on public works could no longer make enough to pay for it. In the spring of 1847, the public works program was shut down, brought to an abrupt halt by the British government. The poor had no food, and now they had no work. This year will always be remembered by the Irish 
as Black 47. Weakened by hunger, the people began to die of fever. Many survivors left their homes in a desperate search for relief, taking sickness with them as they went. Thousands crowded into workhouses where fever spread from one victim to another. This book is a workhouse register which recorded what happened to each individual in the spring of 1847. The entries make monotonous reading. Died, 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 died. With the elimination of the public works, the British government threw the whole burden of famine relief on the Irish ratepayers and many landlords were already hopelessly in debt. Up to this point, the government had borne much of the expense of famine relief. From the autumn of 1847 onwards, the entire burden was to fall on the Irish ratepayers, the landlords and the richer tenants. The new legislation was called the Poor Law Extension Act, and it reflected the views of the Treasury Secretary in charge of famine relief, Charles Trevelyan. In addition to requiring landlords to make the payment of rates or taxes to support workhouses, it also made it illegal for anyone to seek admission to the workhouse if they were in possession of more than a quarter of an acre of land. So, in order to qualify for relief, many starving people had to give up their land, and the new act only made a bad situation worse. Such a tangled mass of poverty, filth, and disease as the applicants presented, I have never seen. Numbers in all stages of fever and smallpox, and all clamoring for admission. The act really hit the landlords because it placed all the onus of famine relief on the shoulders of local ratepayers. As if that wasn't bad enough, the landlords had now to pay the rates of their poor tenants. Whilst were they to do, it began to dawn on them and by evicting their tenants, they could avoid the payments of rates. Tenants spent what little money they had on food, not rent. So it was easy for a landlord to get an eviction order against them. Entire villages were cleared. The poor people who had been evicted weren't allowed to stay on the estate because if they did, the landlord would still be liable for their taxes. Other tenants were forbidden to take them in on pain of eviction themselves. Homeless people lined the roadsides. The ditch side, the dripping rain, and the cold sleet are the covering of the wretched outcast the moment the cabin is tumbled over him. No country ravaged by a hostile army could have been reduced to a more deplorable condition. It's difficult to understand how landlords and their agents could have been so callous. But the effect of the Poor Law Extension Act was to ensure that any landlord who didn't want to be ruined by the famine had almost no alternative but to evict as many people as possible. Towns like Skibbereen and County Cork were the relief centers for huge gatherings of starving people that winter, which also made them centers for the transmission of disease. Skibbereen was the site of the government food store, and the local relief committee ran a soup kitchen for the poor. Any day that you would have come to this town in the winter of 1846-47, you would have seen approximately 8,000 people gathered here, outside the soup kitchen which stands behind me. Now, 8,000 people mightn't sound like much, but today, when 8,000 people go over there to the football pitch, we say there's a huge crowd in town. Here we're talking about 8,000 starving people coming in for food. Furthermore, the soup committee were sending out as many as 700 servings per day up to a distance of four miles out of town to those who actually couldn't come in because they hadn't the strength. Private charities and local relief committees had been running soup kitchens for the poor in some districts almost since the famine began. 
One of the most active charities involved in this work was the Society of Friends, the Quakers who organized emergency food supplies in all of the most distressed areas of Ireland. The Mendicity Institution's dining room in Dublin still serves free meals to all comers with no questions asked, just as it did at the time of the famine. Efforts like this finally prompted the British government into effective action. In the spring of 1847, the government opened soup kitchens for the poor all over Ireland. By the summer, they were feeding three million people a day. It was the biggest relief effort ever mounted by any government up to that time. But it had come too late for hundreds of thousands of people. And for many Catholics, soup kitchens had an evil reputation. In some areas of Western Ireland, the ugly words super and superism were used even before the famine. They referred to the practice of some Protestant evangelical missions which had been trying to convert Catholics by offering free food to children who attended their schools. These mission schools provoked furious opposition from Catholic priests. According to one indignant prelate, It would be better to cut your children's throats with a knife than to send them to such schools. A Church of Ireland minister named Edward Nangle was passionately opposed to the Catholic faith, which he attacked as superstitious idolatry. Nangle built a Protestant colony at Ackle Island in County Mayo and set about converting local people with the help of a school, a dispensary, and his own printing press. And uh, you'd have to turn a Protestant to get any of Nangle's soup. He came like on a difficult mission to establish a Protestant community among a Catholic community. The people were dying with the hunger and he had a shipload of Indian meal with him. And he built a colony down there in Dugart. Even at the height of the famine, Catholic priests worked hard to prevent people from taking Nangle's soup. When you hear what Nangle wrote in his weekly newspaper, it's easy to understand why. To the Roman Catholics of Ireland in general, and of Achill in particular, surely God is angry with this land. The potatoes would not have rotted unless he sent his rot into them. God is good, and because he is, he never sends a scourge on his creatures unless they deserve it. Your priests stand as powerless before the divine judgment as did the magicians before the plagues with which God visited the land of Egypt. At Tumor in County Cork, the Reverend William Fisher was an evangelist who converted as many Catholics as he could to the Protestant faith. His converts were accused of taking the soup trading their faith for food. If true, it was a bitter choice for starving people. Taking the soup was seen as treachery by the Catholics. It was, in Irish, what was called cool akin. It was, they were abandoning their own people as much as their faith. Um, yes, it is hard for us to understand it. I know there was a certain amount of persecution of the people who became converts, they were called supers, and that nickname super is, is still used around the country as an insult. I would say that at the same time that there were very few Protestant clergymen who um, would deny food to a Catholic unless he became Protestant. I think that is a myth. I, I think that would have happened very, very seldom if at all. In the little town of Skull, there was a Church of Ireland vicar at the time of the famine who had very different attitudes from the proselytizers. His name was Robert Trail, and by all accounts, he's one of the heroes of the famine. As well as feeding the people, he visited the sick. An artist from the Illustrated London News made a sketch of him doing this a few weeks before Trail's own death from famine fever. Times of great struggle often reveal the strengths or weaknesses of a person on either side of a religious divide. And not all Catholics displayed their finest moments when famine was knocking at the door.
Beth Streis, uh, a Catholic. And, uh, you know, she sort of built a number of fire escapes, gave a certain amount of uh, charity, like, <laughs> to, so that uh, she would escape the uh, due punishment, I think, anyhow. But, and we hope she did. But uh, she, was a, uh, she was a sub-agent, that is, she collected the rents for the landlord. And, of course, she had a commission. Therefore, the higher the rent, the more she had herself. She died in due course uh, and was buried in the local graveyard, in Ventry Graveyard. Uh, and uh, there's a huge big uh, uh, lack, things for lack, uh, um, stone, not a stone, but a, a slab on her graveyard. And it was uh, used as a dancing platform by a number of people who had no particular love for uh, best rice. Well, we hope she's in heaven with everybody else in spite of all that. Anglo-Irish landlords also get much of the blame for the famine. At Westport House, the Marquess of Sligo tried to be different. He did everything he could, we believe, under the circumstances, to help in every way possible. Uh, he brought in a ship at the quay with grain on it for distribution. He kept the workhouse going uh, at his own expense, in fact, for quite a long time. He travelled the 26 counties, or 26 of the counties of Ireland, uh, consulting with all the appropriate people, trying to see if something could be done about the famine, and also uh, they had a lot of guns and a lot of shot at that time when the famine began, began itself. And uh, they went off over the hills, over the deer park, and they shot all the birds and the deer that they could shoot. And they brought them down into the great big enormous famine pots, which they boiled up great soups with. And they had lines of people that they gave out the soup to. Despite his good intentions, the Marquess began to evict his tenants in 1848. He had received no rent for three years. He borrowed money to pay his taxes and now had to choose between personal ruin or evicting his tenants. It was a choice which many landlords had to make all over Ireland. Some landlords were callous and uncaring, Others behaved quite well. The best behaved were those who could afford it. The Earl of Ross had a great estate in Parsonstown, now Burr, in County Offaly. During the famine, the Earl built miles of stone walls around his property, providing employment for hundreds of impoverished men. <laughs> In the gardens, the Earl and his wife enlarged the lake and began a series of new building works all over the grounds, which improved their property while providing employment for the laboring classes. But the Rosses could afford it. The Earl had the good sense to marry money. A few years before, he took as his wife the rich and clever daughter of a Yorkshire woolens magnate. The Countess designed many of the improvements herself, and it was her money which was put to lavish use in carrying them out. Today's Earl of Ross still resents government expectations that the landlords pay for famine relief. I don't think there was understanding of the crux and core of the problem. Um, I think individuals did marvelously, like the, the Quakers, but I don't think the British government did what it ought to have done. I think far too much was left to philanthropy, as in fact is largely the, the, the case with even our government in, a, in Ireland today. What ought they have to, to have done, in your opinion? I think one of the first things they ought to have done would be to provide re relief from the rating structure so that estates like this did not have to pay rates and uh, had to subsidize the, the economy of Britain as a whole, particularly after it became clear that the tenants were no longer in a position to pay the rents out of which the rates had previously been paid. And this, I think, contributed towards the impoverishment, if not bankruptcy, of a considerable number of estates. And once the estate went to the wall, there was, of course, no employment left for anyone. And the tenants were far worse off than they had been before. Ultimately, many landlords became victims of the famine, just like their tenants. To blame 
landlords for the famine is a, is a great oversimplification. It's uh, just, it will not wash. Uh, some landlords did what they could and, and crashed, uh, lost all they had, and others behaved uh, very cruelly. Uh, the ones who behaved badly, of course, uh, get written up like uh, Lord Lucan, uh, Vandalor and Kilrush, uh, Lord Sligo, um, and Lord Leitrim gets uh, uh, gets mentioned as well. Uh, but um, the trouble is that about one fifth or one quarter of uh, landed property uh, changed hands because of people going bankrupt, uh, and had landlords spent every penny they had, there still would have been a problem. So uh, uh, putting the burden on Irish landed property uh, in 1847 was not a feasible uh, way of uh, dealing with famine relief. The fact is that halfway through the famine, the British government washed its hands of the whole ugly business. Ireland was now left to what Secretary of the Treasury Lord Trevelyan described as the operation of natural causes. He believed the famine was, quite literally, a heaven-sent opportunity to modernize Ireland. He would later be knighted for his services to the country at the time. He saw uh, the famine as uh, a visitation of God, uh, as a way of solving uh, a very serious overpopulation problem and uh, he believed that by and large uh, the government shouldn't intervene very much uh, because in the long run that would uh, make things uh, even worse if the Irish uh, weren't taught a lesson or didn't learn a lesson uh, in the late 1840s then who knows in the 1850s or the 1860s uh, the same was going to happen again and they would have to go through perhaps even a worse catastrophe uh, now, that was the way uh, Trevelyan uh, thought. Uh, critics argued that uh, people who are starving needed food, not lessons in what was known in those days as political economy. Uh, Trevelyan was very well intentioned, but uh, uh, not a very humane man. And uh, the, the atti his attitudes um, were responsible for, uh, undoubtedly, for uh, lots of deaths. You'd have to have a heart of stone not to feel compassion for the Irish peasants when the famine struck. Life was always very difficult for them. Their religion was reviled, their native language and culture despised. There was always the possibility of eviction, and then came the potato blight. It looked like the end of the road, but for some of the lucky ones, there was one last resort, emigration. The Great Irish Famine will continue in a moment here on A&E. Ireland was filled with the sick and the starving. As famine continued, there were but two ways to escape the suffering, death or emigration. The London Times wrote, they are going, they are going with the vengeance, the Celts are going. Pretty soon a Celt on the streets of Dublin will be as rare as an Indian on the streets of Manhattan. Richer farmers were often the first to go. Their own tenants were no longer paying them any rent. They themselves owed rent and were overwhelmed by British taxes. Poorer people soon followed. Sorrow at leaving home came second to the need to survive. Despite the pain of separation and fears of life in a strange land, Emigration seemed the only means of escape. For those who could only scrape together a few pence for the fare, it was possible to take one of the new steam vessels across the Irish Sea to ports in England, Scotland, and Wales. 300,000 people crossed to mainland Britain in 1847 alone. The most popular destination for those fleeing the famine was the port of Liverpool. The first immigrants who came perhaps were the better off ones, but increasingly as the famine bit, the immigrants were poorer. A lot of them were ridden, um, had fever, and they were obviously not welcome because they were a burden on the local taxpayers. And unfortunately, 1847, there was a recession in England. 
So it actually coincided with a period of high unemployment in Britain. And who are these paupers coming from Ireland expecting poor relief? So the sympathy, public sympathy, turned very quickly to wanting to get rid of the problem. It was seen as a problem. And what is interesting is the port authorities in Liverpool and Glasgow, Cardiff, elsewhere, repeatedly asked the government to control the problem, to introduce some sort of fever legislation, to do something, and the government said they could not intervene. Those with the strength to move on drifted toward other towns and cities, joining earlier immigrants in overcrowded slums. Some died of fever, but many survived. Within ten years of the famine, there were half a million Irish-born people in mainland Britain. Most would never return to the old country. For many of the Irish people, escaping to England was not enough. Emigration was not an option for the very poor, unless their fares were paid by richer relatives. Passage to the United States cost about four pounds per person. That was six months' wages for a working man. Children under 14 traveled at half price. Fares to Australia at 14 pounds made the United States look cheap in comparison. Cheapest of all was Canada, and in 1847, 100,000 people opted for British North America. All passengers were supposed to undergo a health inspection to make sure that they were free of disease. But the inspection was cursory, and many infected people escaped detection. The emigrants often had no idea what to expect. Many arrived at the boat dock with all sorts of baggage, which they couldn't possibly take on board, let alone use in their new homes. Few carried what they would really need, extra food to supplement the sparse provisions supplied by the shipping company. The docks swarmed with cheats and thieves who often robbed them of their possessions before they'd even embarked. A Quaker who witnessed peasants embarking for America wrote in his diary, there was nothing but joy at their escape as if from a doomed land. God help them. They didn't know what horrors awaited them once they set sail. The departure itself was often jubilant, with people thronging the decks to say goodbye. Even the congested hold must have seemed exciting at first. But within a short time, the terrible overcrowding must have seemed a continuation of the hell they left behind. Hundreds of poor people, men, women and children of all ages, from the driveling idiot of 90 to the babe just born, huddled together, without light, without air, wallowing in filth and breathing a fetid atmosphere, sick in body, dispirited in heart, living without food or medicine, except as administered by the hand of casual charity, dying without spiritual consolation. The journey could take anywhere from six weeks to three months. Many passengers died on the way and were buried at sea. Others were near death when they arrived at the opposite shore. The worst of the boats became known as the coffin ships. But even on the best of boats, there was death and fever. We sailed three days. We were all seasick. Not a man on board was free. We were all confined unto our bunks and known to pity poor me. No father kind nor mother dear to lift up my head it was so which made me think more of the lassie I left on Paddy's green sham of shore. 
first landfall for ships bound for Canada was Grosse Isle. This was the quarantine station for Quebec, where all vessels carrying sick people were required to stop. There was no deep water pier in 1847, so sick passengers had to be ferried to the shore in small boats. One eyewitness reported that many of the sick were flung on the beach, left amid the mud and the stones to crawl on the dry land as best they could. Another described them dying, like fish out of water. The main cause of the death, of course, was the disease. And uh, you had good captains, you had bad captains, you had good ships, you had bad ships. And you had ships that provided good food and some that provided uh, not so good food. But basically, if the, if the immigrants were healthy when they boarded the ships, they could survive. And uh, it was so, the, the, the high death rates came, of course, on ships where you had fever breaking out. Uh, and, of course, the fever was the main cause of death. If they'd managed to avoid fever on board, they were likely to catch it here. In 1847, the pretty island was completely overwhelmed. Buchanan, the immigration agent in Quebec, knew the 28,000 people were amassing in Liverpool. And the um, Dr. George Mellis Douglas, who was the medical supervisor here, he figured that with the 200 hospital beds and space for 800 healthy people, that he'd be able to handle whatever uh, passengers came up the river. But very soon, by the end of by the end of May, 17,000 people were in the ships in the passage here, waiting to be landed. So uh, the island very soon couldn't handle the thousands who were being landed. In this building behind us, apparently there were, there were double-decker bunks, and um, one can picture the various accidents that occur when you're sick and, and the poor people in the lower bunks suffering from somebody's misery above. So there's, uh, there are conditions, the, the overcrowding, the numbers of people, it's bad enough if one person is or one family is enduring uh, misery and sickness and the death, but when you're surrounded by, by it, uh, the doctors and those in who still had, the priests who still had some elements of, of, of strength and, and health about them, they themselves must have suffered from watching the terrible conditions under which people existed. Douglas at one point says that the things are so bad that he has to put two in a bed and that uh, he quotes at one point, these people are so indifferent to life that they'll even lie alongside a corpse without, without any emotion or without, without showing any, any signs of, of fear or revulsion. They're, they've been reduced to such a terrible condition. 5,400 people are said to be buried in the mass graves on Gros Isle. Some historians believe there are many more. Despite the terrible death toll, over 90% of the immigrants continued on their journey. Many of them were infected with fever and took it with them as they fled up the rivers. The St. John River is navigable all the way up to Grand Falls, close to where it meets with the United States. From here, stronger survivors could slip across the border Some of the new arrivals settled in the Canadian countryside, often joining friends or relatives who'd come over before them. Many more settled in towns like St. John, a seaport on the coast of New Brunswick. The dockside district known as York Point quickly degenerated into an Irish slum where poor immigrants struggled for survival. The quarantine station for St. John was Partridge Island, 
Almost 17,000 Irish people passed through here in 1847, and over 2,000 of them died. The immigration authorities reckoned that one in seven of all famine immigrants died before they'd completed their journey, and those who survived were often in poor health. Local people objected to being used as a dumping ground for the Irish poor. A large number of the uh, St. John, as I would say, were uh, outraged at uh, the large number of sick uh, Irish immigrants coming this summer, uh, you know, the, they were impoverished, they were bringing illness, a variety of diseases that did spread into the city. Um, those, of course, who were of Irish ancestry uh, were just, you know, just the opposite. They wanted to, uh, to help the countrymen. Uh, Common Council has said sometimes they, they did their best to help, but uh, there was uh, one particular case, uh, the vessel Aeolus had made two voyages to St. John in 1847, um, brought approximately a thousand immigrants in total. Uh, a large number of them were ill, and several hundred died from, from those two uh, voyages. And uh, I suppose the, the bubble burst for St. John uh, on that second voyage uh, at the end of the immigrant season in November when Common Council actually passed a resolution asking for the government to basically send all these Irish back to Ireland. Um, we don't want them, we don't need them, we can't afford them. Uh, so let's get rid of them and send them back. To the government's credit, of course, uh, that didn't happen and uh, they weren't sent back. Since then, the Irish have become a strong presence in what was once British North America. The Chatham Festival is an annual Irish-Canadian celebration. It attracts people of Irish descent from a wide area of New Brunswick and beyond. A few of these families are descended from those who came here at the time of the famine, but most are from earlier generations of immigrants both Catholics and Protestants. All of them eager to celebrate any and all aspects of their Irish roots. Seventy-five percent of the Irish emigrants who fled the famine came to the United States, and most of them arrived in New York. America was the great dream, the land of freedom and hope, and New York was the Mecca. Most Irish who came probably didn't know very much about America, but they knew that the Americans had gotten rid of the British, and that must have been a great comfort. The main point of entry for famine immigrants was South Street Wharf on Manhattan Island. There's never been anything like it in American history before this. The whole idea of us as an immigrant nation begins in this place, really, with the Irish immigrants who come through, because they're not just um, immigrants. They're essentially foreign to the people who are living here in New York. They're, they're Catholic. Many of them don't speak English. Uh, and they are perceived as essentially foreign. The great debate in the United States about the reception of foreigners begins here. When they get off these boats and come down onto the ground, they find people waiting for them who uh, pose as people willing to help them. They were called runners, and they were taking their luggage. They would bring them to rooming houses, and the idea was to fleece them of everything they had before they got 100 yards into Manhattan. There were almost no government control of immigration at that time. So that they, were, they thought the end of their journey was, was here. In many ways, this was the beginning of it. This is a sanitized version of 19th century New York. You would have to imagine, you'd have the horse droppings in the street, you'd have privies overrunning, you'd have whorehouses, you'd have taverns, you'd have hotels for sailors, jammed with people, a crowded, noisy, dirty place. And what sort of prejudices and exclusions did they find here? Well, they find that the whole country begins to organize. Their immigration is in such a volume, and they're in such a um, disastrous condition, many of them, when they come here, that there's a whole, it's called a nativist movement in America to stop the Irish immigration into the United States. The largest third party political movement in American history is the Know Nothing Party, which is organized specifically to stop the Irish immigration into the United States. This feeling that with the country is being overwhelmed by this alien group that will never be assimilated. Assimilation took many years. For at least a generation, the Catholic Irish were regarded by Protestant Americans as good-for-nothing drunkards, unfit for proper employment. They lived in poverty and were notorious for drinking and fighting. 
They were often evicted for failure to pay rent with even less ceremony than back home in Ireland. For many years, they were regarded as inherently dishonest, the most likely candidates for prison or the lunatic asylum. The American Civil War began the process of acceptance. Irish soldiers fought bravely on both sides. They had been excluded from power by the English ruling class. Now they seemed destined to become patriots. The pattern of emigration set up by the famine continued as Irish immigrants went on pouring into the United States throughout the second half of the 19th century. The later arrivals were in search of a better life, and they found a far warmer welcome than the famine immigrants. In Ireland, they had been a rural people, but in America, they were city people. And in their close-knit neighborhoods, they began to see that freedom and democracy were a real possibility. And the key that would open America's door was politics. The one thing that they had going for them when they came in this great mass into the United States was the vote. They were enfranchised as white male. Then they made their votes count. And as they got into politics, they got jobs. You know, America, it likes to think of itself a place that welcomes immigrants. In reality, what's happened is most immigrant groups have to force their way in. And that's what kept the Irish together. You know, they were in these cities forcing their way into America, using their votes, sticking together, um, out of sense of self-protection, out of a sense of self-survival, out of a sense of this is how we come into America. You have to force your way in. never forgot the old country, nor did they forget their resentments against the British. Paddy Reynolds remains as Irish as ever, after 50 years in America. He grew up hearing stories of the famine and remains angry at the way his ancestors were treated by the British government. I think that they contributed to the death of about four and a half million Irishmen, women and children. And for that they should pay, whatever way that is possible. They did contribute to it, and they did help to, to keep it going. Mary Holt Moore, a former Grand Master of New York's St. Patrick's Day Parade, believes the famine would have been avoided if the Irish had been self-governing. If a native government had been in charge in Ireland, the people would not have starved. But the absentee landlords who want the land for cattle grazing, wanted to get rid of the people on the land. England didn't care as long as her people were covered. And so the Irish, it didn't matter. And I think it was terrible. And it's something that I believe England can never uh, turn its back on. She cannot say she doesn't know it happened. Because John Stuart Mills, the greatest economist of his era, and an Englishman said there was enough food in Ireland to feed 20 million people. And the Irish died with their teeth stained green and their, their hands in agony green by the roadside, while ship after ship after ship with Irish grain, wheat, pigs, sheep, cattle, left 13 seaports back and forth, back and forth, and the Irish dying because all they had with the rotted potatoes. Nothing generates more rage and controversy over the famine than the fact that Irish farmers continued to export food, not just beef, but bacon, butter, cheese, and many other products to England throughout the years of hunger, even though their own people were starving at the time. 
cattle shipments actually increased during the famine, and this export in food trade is often portrayed as an act of calculated genocide by the British government. But was it? There was nothing to stop that food staying in Ireland. Um, it would have stayed in Ireland, presumably, if the farmers in question had got a higher price on the local markets than they got on the export market. Uh, nobody forced the food to leave the country. It didn't have to leave the country to pay rents either. Um, there was a common currency between the two countries. The rent could have been paid by food sold in Dublin just as well by food sold in Liverpool. Um, the reason the food didn't stay in Ireland is because the people who were starving didn't have the wherewithal to buy this food. Now, the alternative would have been for the government to compulsorily buy the food in the markets, but that would have caused a similar process of objection by the people selling it, who were mostly Irish, who were mostly Catholic, who were, by and large, not the landlords. They were the farmers. They were the middling ranks in Irish society. And they obviously wanted to get the maximum market price for what they were selling. If the government had paid maximum market prices, it would, it would have been a matter of indifference to them. There was also long established grain trade with England, and the government refused to interfere with the free market. Some nationalists have always maintained that the famine was artificial, that Ireland had plenty of grain, but it was all exported to England while the people starved. One of the, the stock folk images uh, of the famine is cartloads and uh, barge loads of grain uh, moving east. And uh, uh, of course, uh, grain continued to be exported during the famine, but far more grain was imported. I mean, the, the balance of trade in grain was uh, adverse and uh, very markedly so during the famine period. Uh, but of course, uh, the grain imported was of low quality. It tended to be uh, Indian meal or maize, whereas uh, what was exported was oats and, and wheat. Um, but the only period in which there would have been an excess of exports over imports would have been uh, at the very beginning in uh, late 46 and early 47 and that is because of course the maize uh, took a while to arrive from distant shores. During the final year of the famine, 1849, the Lord Lieutenant of Ireland invited Queen Victoria on a state visit to Dublin, Cork and Belfast. Famine mythology always says that the Queen gave a five pound note to help the poor. In fact, she gave over 2,000 pounds, and her visit was surprisingly well received by the Irish people. She drove everywhere in an open carriage through cheering crowds. History suggests that throughout the famine, most Irish people got on with their lives as best they could. It was the worst tragedy in Irish history. Why did it happen? You're watching an a &E special, The Great Irish Famine, only on a and &E as it came to be. In the 1890s, the government finally recognized that the land tenure system was the root of Ireland's unrest. It embarked on a series of land reforms, breaking up the great estates and redistributing the land among the small farmers. The slow demise of the Anglo-Irish landlords, which began with the Great Famine, was completed by a final land reform act in 1903. Today, the Irish countryside is still littered with the abandoned houses of the Anglo-Irish gentry, who had once seemed all-powerful. The Church of Ireland, the church of the ruling class, went into decline. After the famine, there was a wave of revulsion against it. Eventually, the congregations dwindled and the beautiful old buildings went into decay.
The Roman Catholic Church, on the other hand, went from strength to strength after the famine. came out with the advantage that the proportion of clerics, nuns as well as priests, to the population increased greatly. I think it was one to about a thousand of the population after the famine, where it had been one to maybe four thousand before. Those are rough figures, but it was that kind of, it was in the order of that kind of change. The great triumphalist age of church a building had in a sense begun before the famine but like those other changes I mentioned accelerates to an almost qualitatively different um, state of things after the famine. By and large though the Catholic Church does establish a kind of social control I think in the mid to late 19th century that it didn't necessarily have in the early to mid 19th century and it may also have if you like profited from the sense of trauma and desolation which certainly affected Irish life in the generation after the famine where the consolations of religion were probably what people turned to. But still the Irish suffered a great cultural and spiritual loss. The people who once lived in great numbers in these remote areas were extremely traditional. They spoke the Irish language and practiced their own ancient Celtic customs. The famine cleared them from great tracts of land. Some people have seen this near extinction of an entire community as a kind of martyrdom. In many parts of the country, the people are holding commemorations to honor those who suffered 150 years ago. Most of them take place in the south and west, like this one on the coast of Mayo, where suffering was most severe. On this occasion, the committee has invited the grandson of the great Indian leader Gandhi as a guest of honor. The celebrations are uplifting and mildly patriotic. Time to show community solidarity. In County Limerick, a group of workers has begun to rebuild some of the abandoned cabins. The Nokfirna group have no special agenda other than to try to better understand the people who once lived here. They know the people were poor. They know they suffered terribly in the famine. But they also suspect that the old inhabitants enjoyed the stories, the music, and a rich cultural life that's now hard to find in rural Ireland. There are other kinds of famine commemoration. This local drama group from Lewisburg in County Mayo is reenacting a local legend. According to that story, 600 starving people set out from the town in a desperate search for food. Their journey crossed a raging torrent where some were swept away and drowned. Mercifully, the river didn't quite play its part on this occasion. According to the legend, the starving people were on their way to Delphi, a fishing lodge some ten miles away where the poor law guardians were said to be holding a meeting. After a long and miserable journey, the sad procession at last arrived at the Delphi Fishing Lodge. 
According to the story, the guardians were stuffing themselves with lunch when the poor people arrived and begged for food. Rejected by the uncaring guardians, the starving people started back for Lewisburg. As they staggered homewards, a severe storm blew up while they made their way along the shores of Duloch, the Black Lake. There, a tremendous gust of wind swept 400 of them into the lake where they were drowned. In fact, six people died here in a tragic accident in 1849. But the story preserves the memory of a time when people struggled hopelessly against an overpowering act of nature. Mythology can be a potent ingredient in motivating people and shaping events. This is an annual walk organized by AFRI, an Irish charity devoted to helping poor people in the third world. Like the actors in the previous story, the walkers retrace the route which the starving people took across a great bog and along the shores of Duloch. They see the Duloc story as a symbol of the neglect and betrayal of the poor Irish people at the time of the Great Famine. And they use the myth to focus attention on present day needs and suffering of poor people in the world today. AFRI was founded to support small poverty projects in the third world, mainly in India. And I suppose it could have been characterized in its early days as a black baby organization, just simply giving money to help these poor people. But one thing we've realized is that what the poor need uh, more than charity is justice. And we can see extraordinary parallels between what happened in our history and what's happening today. And I suppose what we're trying to do in terms of this Great Famine project is to ensure that it's not just about looking back at the past. Uh, and, and just remembering the pain of the past, that if we believe what happened to our people in the past was wrong, then it's equally wrong if it's happening to any other human being, and of course it is. And so I think that we've got to then look at what are our responsibilities as Irish people uh, in relation to the poor and the hungry throughout Asia, Africa and Latin America today. Ireland's president, Mary Robinson, was the only Western leader to make a personal visit to Somalia to see for herself the sufferings of the people and the efforts made by Irish charities to relieve them. President Robinson also attended the opening of the new Irish Famine Museum at Strokestown Park in the summer of 1994. The old Anglo-Irish estate mansion has now assumed a new and meaningful function in an Ireland that is completely different than the one that originally produced it. We stand at the heart of Irish history. This is not only what happened to us, it is what we are. Ireland, President Robinson is patron of the Famine Museum because she believes that it holds important lessons for the Irish people today. The President contends that Ireland's history gives her a sympathetic understanding of the problems faced by poor countries throughout the world today. And I think that Ireland does have quite a unique position as a member of the European Union, geographically located in Western Europe, in you know, the Richmond's Club for a lot of the world's perception, and we are a reasonably prosperous country. But our experience has been that of a colony striving for independence and of a country devastated by appalling famine. Ireland was forever changed by the Great Famine. Among the Irish who came to America, most would never return to their native shore. But each generation has heard the stories and felt the pain. It is noteworthy that most of the frontline relief during the Irish famine was done by private charities. So it is today in the third world. So much more is needed. <laughs>
If we in the West don't do more to help the poor of the world, we may one day find that history will judge us as harshly as it does the British government at the time of the great Irish famine. Now you can own The Great Famine, Ireland's Potato Famine, the companion book to the television series written by John Percival for only $24.95 plus shipping and handling. Call 1-800-423-1212. Keep your eyes peeled as biography explodes on the scene with Hollywood Hot Shots, all next week at 8 Eastern, 9 Pacific. Now, put a little laughter in your late night with some standout stand-up. A&E's Evening at the Improv.